it's wonderful that we are in an information age where knowledge, information, wisdom, even potentially, (laughs) as long as we filter it correctly, is at our fingertips. Amazing that that happens. However, there's so much to slog through that can completely overwhelm us. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On this show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Every week, I bring you the latest scoop on what these incredible people do to succeed and how you can get their secrets and do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you support the show on Patreon. You get some exclusive and fun bonuses. Go to patreon.com slash innovative mindset and join in. And now let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am your host, and I am thrilled that you're here, and I am thrilled and excited for this week's guest. And you know what's really funny about what I'm about to say is that I'm about to possibly completely mangle her name because normally I am organized enough to ask the person how to say their name, but this time I wasn't. So here we go. Lisa Zarotny, hopefully I did that right, is the founder of Positively Productive Systems and the host of Positively Living Podcast. As a certified stress management and productivity coach, now you know why I'm having her on the show because she's going to help me probably more than she helps anybody else in this episode. Lisa shares the powerful healing of simplicity, self-care, and structure with multi-passionate entrepreneurs and multitasking caregivers. Lisa became a coach and speaker after a deeply overwhelming time in her own life juggling multiple roles as a caregiver, wife, mother, and business owner. You can relate, right? She is now on a mission to help her overwhelmed audience make space for what matters in their lives by teaching value-based decluttering and customized systems and habits design. Lisa holds certifications in stress and time management, life coaching, and meditation, and is a member of the American Institute of Stress and the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. Wow, Lisa, I am so glad that you're here. Welcome. Oh, thank you, Isolde. And you nailed the last name. So you get a thousand bonus points right off the bat. Yay! Oh, that's so ex- that's exciting because, you know, with my last name, people are always like, uh, yeah, that's me. The name you absolutely can pronounce, that's my name. So I usually do remember, but this time I completely forgot to ask you and decided to go ahead and go, I'm going to chance it. So I'm really glad I did. So I, I want to, I want to, I want to, there's so much here that I want to talk to you about because wow, that you help people organize their lives in a time when so many of us are overwhelmed and feeling completely disorganized. And I wanted to ask what, what inspired you, what transpired in your life to move you in this direction of, of not only organizing yourself, but helping others overcome so many of those same obstacles? Well, I think that, uh, it's always been my personal MO that when I figure something out, I want to share it with others. I'm like, I figured this out here. Let Mm. me show you. So I I don't suppose in that regard, it's any surprise that I did this, but the uh, events that transpired in my life were uh, big enough that they really created a huge, it's like a paradigm shift for me. Really. Mm -hmm. I was a caregiver for my mom. She had Alzheimer's. I moved her in when I was pregnant with my son. Wow. Then I was pregnant with my daughter. And so I had an infant, a toddler, Mm. and my mother, um, you know, progressing through this disease. Uh, All while my husband and I were still kind of running a business, but, uh, but sort of, you know, shifting that, of course, as much as we needed to while he was working full time. And you can imagine the the survival mode that we were in. You can imagine the overwhelm. And it wasn't just in the moment and moment to moment that I had this overwhelm. I had to let go of, you know, lots of negotiables, lots of options in my life, but I also let go of non-negotiables that should have been non-negotiables, but what can you do? You know, you you Mm. do the best you can in the moment. Uh, And by the time she passed away and that role of mine as a caregiver was gone and I looked around at the fallout, 
it was the overwhelm from all the experiences plus all the things that I couldn't attend to. And I'm talking about bins of papers and, you know, things that just I couldn't get to. And it, all of that overwhelm, all that chaos, all that clutter was kind of staring at me. And in that moment, I was actually thinking, okay, what do I need to do next? We really need, you know, to fix our financial situation because it was, it was, we were struggling. Mm. Do I get a job? What do I do? And, and a voice inside me said, wait a minute, you don't add something. You don't do something more. You need to clear out. Mm. You need to clear a path. And that's what I began doing. And I read books on organizing and, and watched shows and, and started, uh, you know, listening to thought leaders and essentially decluttered my life inside and out. That's the way that I describe it, at least retrospectively, I can kind of see that's what it was. It was this idea of saying, okay, I need to minimize, I need to figure out how we want to live. I need to let go of things I thought I was supposed to keep. But now I realize what, what's the point? It's stuff, you know, and I started to also let go of the stuff inside, like these obligations and things that I that I, I thought I needed to do. And I was like, nope, nope, it's all going. I mean, I jettisoned <laughs> things from my life. And I thought, wow, this is so freeing. And then my family, you know, was a little rocky at first, but it really it started to heal me and heal them. And I thought, oh, I'm on to something here. So I started helping people. I'm taking all of that in. <laughs> it's taking a lot. I know. It it is because there's so there's so much of, of what you just said. I'm I've been really fascinated recently with self-awareness mm -hmm. and, as it juxtaposes with courage because what I heard you say took a lot of self-awareness. Being able to say no, this can go. No, I'm going to say no to this whatever this is. I'm going to streamline. That takes a lot of self-knowledge and also a lot of going inside. What did you do for yourself to to find that courage to to go inside and say to yourself that it was going to be okay to say no to all of these things? Oh, that's a great question. Some of it is definitely faith-based. And, and I don't necessarily mean that in a religious standpoint, but just mm -hmm. this trust, really. Trust mm -hmm. in yourself that you're like, okay, I need to make one choice at a time here. And I need to believe that in that moment, it's the next right thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of it. But you're absolutely right about the self-awareness. And that's something I coach to this day. It's like, think about what you value? What are your core values? Do you know them? Have you explored that? Do you know what you want out of life? And those were the things that I was doing. I was trying to figure out, well, what do I want? And I think one of the biggest gifts of burnout that I, I recall in that moment was I had a limit. I, I, you know, I was still probably in, in postpartum, you know, having postpartum issues and, and, um, you know, some form of depression, I, my energy was shot, I had a lot of physical health issues as well. Mm. And that, that was a wake up call for me. I was like, Whoa, wait a minute, I have to step back here, I need to prioritize my own care. So then when you start to look at all the things that are in front of you, whether they're objects, or tasks, requests from people, whatever it happens to be, you have to ask yourself, do I have the capacity to um, allow this in my life? Does this make sense? Does it fit? Does it get in the way? You know, what, what's going on with it? And so it's not like I completely cleared out immediately. You know what I mean? This took time. Mm. This took years. I'm still doing it in some ways. And it, it was each and every step I had to trust myself and kind of refer back to my own values, my own mission, you know, what I was, what I was trying to accomplish, what I wanted out of life. So that's, it's, it's step by step and it's learning more and more about yourself and about how you want to live. And uh, I think now is the perfect time to bring up one of my favorite quotes from Peter Walsh. And I think it's so important for our conversation today, because when we talk about things that we call clutter, we need to make sure we're defining them properly. 
Mm. Clutter is not just the stuff on your floor. It's anything that stands between you and the life you want to be living. Oh, that's brilliant. Wow. The truth of that just hit me <laughs> right between the eyes. I I feel like some of that clutter that you just mentioned is uh like taking me as as the as the test subject if you will so mm -hmm. i know for example some of my clutter is stuff that comes in but a lot of my clutter is my attachment to the things i think i need to be doing or keeping mm. if you see what i mean yes. so 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 we have these habits my my habit is i can i've never met a book i didn't love so i have thousands and thousands of books for example i don't need all of them i don't i won't read all of them. i won't read them again but how do i as our little test subject mm -hmm. how do i do that how do i say to myself you know what maybe it's okay to donate some of these books to the library or to a school or something like that what what are your thoughts on that how how what's the turning point for someone who needs to make that transition, but who isn't quite perhaps ready yet? So there's a couple of things that you're already doing. Number one, by asking this question. So mm -hmm. you have this awareness to say, I don't need all of these. I have an attachment to them. So the things that we would want to explore, if I'm working with you as a professional organizer, I would be asking you, okay, so what is the attachment? What do they mean to you? And kind of coming up with these categories of, mm -hmm. you know, what they represent in terms of your identity and what you feel the need is to have them there. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, again, are these books clutter? Are they getting in between you and the life you want to be living? It's not always a yes. Mm -hmm. In this case, you're asking me about it. So I'm getting the sense that it may be a yes, or at the very least, the sheer amount that you have mm -hmm. may be a yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, well, how do you want to be living? What do you need space for? Because just like with habits, like I would talk about, you don't get rid of bad habits, but you crowd out the bad with the good, or I don't even like so much bad and good in terms, but uh, rather things that serve you, things that don't. You, you always look to see what's serving me, what do I want to be doing, where do I want to be going? Because mm -hmm. what you focus on, you fuel, uh, you know, and it expands. So look toward what you want. It's like, if I don't have proper space to create my art, and because the books are encroaching on it, right? <laughs> then that gives me purpose to say, well, what can I release and make space for? You're clearing a path and you're creating space for what matters. And I think that's so important and fascinating what you just said. And uh, I was a little disingenuous because I did when we moved from Maryland to New York City, you know, mm -hmm. from a house into a tiny apartment. Yep. Uh, I got rid of about 5000 books. So so I was I was a little disingenuous. I have to admit, I don't have I have one bookshelf full of books now because because of that, because I had to make that choice. Fantastic. So so some of that is uh, internal boundaries and some of that is external boundaries. And, and what I mean by that is, and I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. When we are in a, like me moving from a house into an apartment, I had, I had new external boundaries. I could not possibly keep 5,000 books anymore. Right. Right. So, so I had by the, by the nature of where I was going to be living, I had to, I had to switch the, what I was doing and how I was doing it. But sometimes yes. they're internal boundaries the the like I said the attachment and sometimes it's uh, uh, how do I put this it's a comfort thing mm -hmm. for people like oh if I have this stuff I might need it again someday so how do you how do you work through that it, it for for example for an art for an artist and I can use I'll use my husband as this example mm -hmm. he he's an artist and he also is a performer and he has hundreds of pieces of potential equipment that might be useful someday and he hasn't used some of it in 15 years but it goes with him wherever he does right right so how does someone like that who who who's like well i'm an artist and i might need this rubber ball someday for something so i'm going to keep it how do you figure out 
whether or not you actually will need it or if it's okay to go, well, if I need something like this someday, then I will perhaps get another one rather than, than carrying the, the trunk of all the stuff with you wherever you go. Well, that's a great question because there's so much within that because the I might need it someday can be based on your own fears in terms of finances mm -hmm. and wondering how you're going to, you know, purchase something again, should you need it. It could be the idea, I think, when we when we're creators of thinking, well, I want to have these options around so I have the maximum, you know, sort of ability to to create you know mm. what i mean and to mm -hmm. have these things so there's a there's a number of different reasons so i think ultimately for this question for the one that we talked about before is getting back to the understanding of not what the stuff is but what it represents mm -hmm. is it identity is it comfort uh you're right uh, clutter can be comfort it can protect us from things if we don't go through it we don't make the decisions then we don't have to struggle with the decisions we don't have to get to the next thing Maybe it's like, oh, well, I want to clear the space so that I can set up this thing next. Mm -hmm. But you're saying you want to do it. You want to do it. But maybe part of you is holding you back so we can self-sabotage. Mm. But in terms of your question of, OK, so we have this amount of stuff that is we'll call it accessories for the you know sake of a better term. How do you identify how much? Well, one of the things you mentioned was what I call limits. I have what I call the simple system, which is a framework that you go step by step to figure out how to declutter. S is for setting yourself up, which has to do with the administrative and, and deciding part of it. Like I'm going to make some changes. I is identifying the purpose. M is matching up things. So, you know, like you have this whole collection of accessories uh, and then P is for paring down based on those choices. Like you said, the internal uh, factors of like what matters, what do you want? But then the uh, L is limits as in your space, like how much space do you have? You talk about having a New York City apartment. That's a definite difference than if you have a farmhouse in upstate mm -hmm. New York. You know what sure. I mean? Uh, that's one thing. The limit too can also be your your mental limit of well, how much can you realistically sort through to find what you need? Mm. Because if every time you are going to access something, because organizing is really about access. It's not about looking pretty. It's not about being in a magazine. It's about can I find what I need when I need it? Oh, yes, you're singing my song. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. I mean, there. I think it's. It, it sounds to me like what you're saying is you can have a pretty convoluted system as long as it works for you and mm -hmm. you can find what you're looking for. Absolutely. I, yay, that's so wonderful because, because I know people who are afraid of that very thing of of, uh, oh, I'm going to throw things away and I'm not going to be able to find what I need when I need it anyway. And what do I do then? And so I'm so glad to hear you say that because it feels like sometimes it it's not a tempest in a teapot. But it, it's almost like you, you create a crisis for mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. that things are much worse than they are and and therefore you you can't you know the word can't being in quotes mm -hmm. you can't start a journey of of you know and it's funny because i feel like decluttering is one of those one of those freight words that that kind of it leaves me a little uh it takes me aback a little because there's so much more to it mm -hmm. than than removing clutter it's not just removing clutter it's almost like organizing yourself and internally and externally you know what i mean so so yeah. when we talk about that when we talk about this sort of crisis mentality of i can't i can't take time to do this i'm just going to throw this here because putting it away in the system that i've developed is going to take too much mm -hmm. then how how do we how do we explore that and how do we overcome that as people who are uh, you know, most of my audience are, are people who are either creative or want to be creative. So how does someone who is a creative person 
who might be more used to living, you know, crisis to crisis or, or, or mm -hmm. wandering around with their hair on fire. How do they develop the system for that and how do they maintain it? Well, let's start by stepping back real quick to, let's say, this this hypothetical collection of accessories and trying to decide the amount. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. your capacity is going to be different. And again, how much you're sorting through. If you say, okay, I'm going to go do this project and you go to sort through these, whatever these things are, mm -hmm. if it's overwhelming to you, then it's then something needs to change mm -hmm. and that's where you start to decide well is it the quantity because for some people and that's why decluttering is big that's why we do talk about letting go of things and reducing and simplifying mm -hmm. because for some of us the capacity is we need to sort or or shift through, you know, a smaller amount of items because it's easier for us. If it is, that opens up the space to, like you said, avoid that crisis, choose what you want, and then start creating or start on the project or get just get started, whatever it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. if, if the sheer amount that you have is keeping you from taking action, then that's a sign. Right? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, Lisa, you're saying so many things that I'm like, <laughs> I need to take this in. I know, I know. Uh, because because it is to me, I I have I have an ironclad rule. For example, I do yoga every day and I've been doing meditate. I've been meditating and doing yoga every day for like 26 years. And I have a rule with myself. And the rule is I have to at least step on the yoga mat every day. Now, mm -hmm. I don't have to do yoga. I can go, okay, I've stepped on it. I have other things to do right now. And I, I get to step off and feel guilt free because I did the bare minimum, which was stepping on the yoga mat. Now in 26 <laughs> years, I can count on one hand, the number of times I haven't gone on and done some meditating and yoga. I, it's just part of my thing, but the guilt free part is really important. Like mm. I do what I can and then I move on because I'm allowed to. So what you were talking about right there kind of feels like it's the same thing in some ways that, you know, do what you can and then move on, but don't beat yourself up about it. And and that part of it is, I, to me, very, very important. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. And what you're talking about, the the thing that you've described is almost like the, what I call the ideal, uh, like the quintessential habit, the, the way that you want to develop a habit, which is to take something, the smallest step that you can make mm -hmm. and say, this is all I'm trying to do. It's nothing more than that. And I think we do feel that same way when we're like, I have to declutter all the things and I have to clean out. And it's okay. It's like, no, what I really want you to do is back up and first of all, identify, is this really clutter or somebody else telling you it is? because that can happen. And sure. then secondly, say you don't have to tackle all of this at one time, but you do need to identify what's not working for you, what's getting in the way, and then start looking. So when we're talking about reducing, it's like there's always going to be a process in this because your life is going to change, your needs are going to change, your space, your capacity. All of these things are in constant flux. And 2020 certainly <laughs> showed us that, right? Absolutely. But, but with regard to that, you can say, okay, this container that I'm sorting through, this is a bit much. What can I do with these items? Sometimes it's a matter of categorizing, but you hit upon a real key here. And this is where there are different steps to the process that play together. We're doing one at a time. The first thing we're talking about is decluttering. Well, you know, that's talking about the amount. It's talking about what you need, what makes sense to you. But once you've decided that, or if you're like, I really want to keep all of this, then the next thing that you need to figure out is where do I keep it and how do I access it? Now you're starting to talk about habits of, well, when I need to get this item, how do I get to it? How quickly can I get to it? I use it when I go to put it back. Is it easy to put back? And can I keep that habit up? Can I close what it, what's called the task loop? You know, mm -hmm. you take the item out, you use it, you put it back. This is another place where we have clutter and it's not the clutter that doesn't necessarily meet our values or our needs or belong. It's the clutter that we are not able to 
put back in its home. And that's more of a habit related thing. So, okay. Yeah. So that, that brings me, I have, I have all these questions so that hmm. brings me to uh, the, 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 the thing that I was, I think I brought it up just a little bit mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I kind of veered off because there's so many things to talk about. Uh, it's about maintaining the process. Like yes. you, you've gotten to the point where you have a process, but how do you keep it going? What, what are the strategies that someone would employ to keep the process going? Like you said, closing that loop, how would mm -hmm. you do that? What are the, what are the steps? Well, one of the biggest, and this is how it all, it's so funny. It's that it, this is not necessarily linear, you know, at times. And you kind of, you're like, wait, go refer back to step one. You're like, what kind of flow chart is this? <laughs> so, but, but bear, but bear with me here because this is true. It's like, if you're not able to close the task loop, if you're not able to keep up this habit, then, then you start getting curious because it's a new set of data for you to to check out, okay? Mm. It's it, to be curious about. Number one could be, do you still have too much and it's hard to get back in there? A great example, I'm sure everybody's had the situation where you have a closet where you have these like bins, re even really nice plastic bins where things are organized in them and you have at least four of them stacked together. And when you go into the closet, invariably you need the one in the bottom bin. Am I right? Oh, totally. All right. So you take out the three bins, you go to the fourth, you get out the item, no problem. You put the bins back in, you use it. When you are done with that item and it needs to go in that bottom bin, what are the chances that it's going back in the bin, right? I mean, it happened. Hello, I'm raising both my hands. It's happened to me multiple Absolutely. times. So then you have to say, okay, what's going on? Is that in the right spot? How often am I using it? You know, you mm. think in terms of when you're organizing now, not just decluttering, but organizing, you're talking in terms of frequency or what I call prime real estate, the things that you're able to get to very quickly and easily need to be the things that you're using the most often. Uh, you know, so it's a combination. Do you have too many things that the stuff is getting in the way or do you not have things in the right spot? Makes sense. Yeah, yeah it really does. And, you know, and, and it's funny when you said that I went and vice versa, you yeah. know, not only do, well, I don't even remember how you said it, but the, the point for me was the things that you use most often need to be the most accessible. Absolutely. You know, that's so, that's so key. And it's not something, it's, it's weird. I'm going to just say it. It's weird because yes, logical, absolutely. But it's not something you think about. Yes. The thing that I use every day, like your toothbrush, you should know where your toothbrush is and it should be in the same place. <laughs> it should not travel. You know, it should stay in the same place so that you can easily access it and then put it back where it belongs. Mm -hmm. And yet there are lots of times when we don't, we don't put things back where they belong. I'm in a hurry. I have things to do. I'm running around with my hair on fire, blah, blah, blah. It's a busy day. And the thing that I just took out of that bin in the closet I say to myself, I'll put it back later. Mm -hmm. What what are the steps, if there are any, or if it's not linear, then help me, help me. Okay. What what are the steps for that? When you promise yourself you're going to put this thing back in tub A, but you don't. Is there is there a way to swing back around? Do you do a nightly check? How does that work? That is one possibility, but I. Uh... I wanted to get into this next topic, which you you segued into beautifully, which is that not only do we need to look at where things are placed, how much we have, you know, to see how, how are we accessing this? How easy is it to put back, you know, uh, how we're organizing things, all of that matters. But then there's another part to this, which mm. is that feeling of, I don't have time for this. If it if if it's really easy to put back, you probably do have time for it, and you might just be fooling yourself. And our brains love to do that. Mm. Our brains will constantly be like, "Zolda, this seems really really hard. Don't you think it's really hard? Don't you think you don't want to do it right now because it seems really hard?" And <laughs> what then are you you're doing like, inside my head, Lisa? Right? Get out yeah, of my I head. <laughs> I know, I know. It, this is a brain thing. I mean, our brains are just looking out for us. They don't mm. want to protect us. And sometimes you're like, yeah, but you don't always know what's best for me. So mm. uh, so if you are constantly saying, 
I don't have time for this. If you are multiple times, you've used the phrase, you know, uh, uh, the running around on fire kind of right. <laughs> visual. If that's happening now, we need to start talking about the clutter in your to-do list and in your schedule. Mm -hmm. Are you leaving enough buffer time, uh, which is what I call it, in between so that you have transition time in between tasks, in between projects. Um, ideally, when you are carving out time, whether you're blocking time, you know, however you're doing it, to let's say work on some art or, you know, practice music, you need sufficient time to put away the things when you're done. It's not only about the moment and the thing that you're doing. It's about the getting set up and then putting things back away. Mm -hmm, That's the mm -hmm. entire time that you need. Much like when you say, oh, I have a doctor's appointment at 10 a.m. Uh, you can't leave at 10 a.m. You have travel time and you have other factors that play. So that's one aspect um, in terms of do I have enough time to put this away and I'm going to do it later. I'll just set it down and do it later. That's one thing that happens. Mm -hmm. The second is we often fool ourselves into thinking something will take longer than it really will. So a tip that I have for you is when you're finding certain tasks or habits where you tend to think that like oh, that putting that laundry together or do, putting this away or doing this task is just it, it's going to take too long I'll do it later try it and time yourself and surprise yourself you know because oh, it's going to take a different amount of time than you think it will yeah, yeah exactly makes a lot of sense yeah, yeah so yeah. give yourself some real data to be like oh that only takes five minutes I do have time for that so yeah, looking at your schedule and then being realistic about how long something's going to take in addition to where are you keeping it and, mm -hmm. you know, how are you organizing it? See how mm -hmm. they, they all play together. It's, and you have to kind of, it's trial and error in each of those areas. But when you start honing each of them, you'll, you'll come up with a process that will, will become much more efficient. It sounds to me like it takes a, a fair amount of attention to mm -hmm. all of that in order yes. to be able to do it. So certain things for creatives work really well, you know, mm -hmm. systems, not always, but, but certain things work really well. Like when I work with my clients, one of the things that I do is I build in time before and time after between every appointment, uh, 15, 20 minutes, something like that, mm -hmm. to sort of get into the right headspace. Right. Yes. I want to be in the right headspace before I work with a client and I want to have time to sort of decompress after we work together. So it's interesting that for me, I'm able to do that when I'm going to be dealing with another person, but I don't always do that for myself. And that brings me to a question that I'd love to talk to you about mm -hmm. and, and tell me if it's not, if it's not a hat you wear, but I'd love to talk about some of the psychology of overwhelm like what does it do to us when we feel overwhelmed and and how do we uh, work through that in order to get to the other side of being able to build some of these systems and buffers and and knowing ourselves well enough to know what we need well i can tell you that the hat that i do wear is relating to clutter and stress and i think that that touches upon this mm -hmm. which is simply that you know Clutter itself, you know, okay, what happens when you have things that are clutter? And we talked about the, the quote being it's, you know, whatever is getting in the way of you and the life you want to be living. You can't find things. You're losing time. It raises your stress response or it initiates your stress response and, and mm -hmm. raises your cortisol levels. Okay. Um, when you have clutter surrounding you, that if, if it's something you're at peace with, again, not clutter, but if it is clutter, it's in your way and mm -hmm. think of it, it, the easiest way to think of it is physical clutter. So we're talking about that, but it can be anything that's in your way. That's a trigger to you, to your brain psychologically that you have unfinished tasks mm. and our brains love to ignore what you accomplished. If I said, Hey, Zolda, what did you do last week? And you're like, up stuff you know what I mean like <laughs> and and I but and but if we sit down I you know sit down for a coaching session and we go through it all you'll be like 
whoa, hello. You know, like I accomplished so much, but your brain is like, ooh, we're done with that. We are removing it. Mm -hmm. You're not going to think about that. Now you're going to think about all the stuff you still need to do. And unfortunately, clutter in, in whatever capacity is like this constant reminder. And so it's distracting you. It's taking up energy and focus. And that's the big one is it's taking away your focus. And also when you have a stress response, you, you know, it's, it's like taking energy away from your brain. So, you know, whenever you're like, okay, so now, uh, systems are not going to be functioning, you know, at full capacity, Mm. what's going to happen, you're not going to be able to focus as well, you're not going to show up as well. So really, I think that's the, that's the crux of it. Again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, Yeah. what? uh, So a lot of this for me, a lot of what you're saying is, is about showing up well for myself, for my, you know, for my husband, for my friends for my business all of that a lot of it is just i want to be there i want to show up Mm -hmm. and yet uh i guess the 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 thing that i'm thinking about with with this idea of clutter and showing up to to handle it whether it's sort of internal clutter or external clutter is that it seems like there are different kinds it seems like there are different kinds and different ways to show up to deal with them how does that work? How do you identify the different kinds of clutter? And what do you do about them once you know what they are? Oh, that's a great question. How much time do you have? (laughs) (laughs) All the time you want. (laughs) I know. But what I will say is this, I actually identified uh, a set, uh, a set of types that that I see most often as a coach. Mm -hmm. And I do speak about them frequently because I think it's so important that we identify that there are different types. So there's uh, the physical, it's very obvious, it's very tangible, we see it. But then there's the mental and emotional side. Uh, There are tasks, you know, and our, our schedule. And then there's also information overload. Mm. We can, we receive clutter all the time in our inboxes and on Mm. social media. And, you know, it's wonderful that we are in an information age where knowledge, information, you know, wisdom, even potentially, (laughs) as long as we filter it correctly, right, is at our fingertips. Amazing that Mm -hmm. that happens. However, there's so much to slog through that can completely overwhelm us. Mm. And so we need to proceed with caution. Sometimes they do overlap because I'll give you a great example. And just in the, you know, the last few days, so much has happened in the US. Mm. (laughs) And it has been emotionally overwhelming. But Mm -hmm. then there's information overload, because all the news media is coming at you and everything on social media is coming at you. And you have to think in terms of what am I allowing into my space? Do you see how it's, even though it's different kinds of clutter, you you talk about it in a similar way? Mm -hmm. Do I have room for this? In other words, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. some people have more room than others. I have very little room for that because my emotional response, my stress response is so extreme mm-hmm. to this hatred and it, you know, it hurts my heart. So I know that if I want to be a functional human being and a coach who shows up properly, I, I need to limit my exposure to that information that's coming at me. Absolutely. I I totally get you and I have I go on news blackouts. I just yes. stop all of it and I totally understand where you're coming from. But having said that, uh some of us are news junkies, mm-hmm. you know? We 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 need to keep that coming in. We and some of it, it it's I forget what it what the uh, fear of missing out FOMO, I think FOMO. it is. Yeah. So so if you have FOMO, if you if you're in that space of uh, what if I miss something? What has to happen inside you to prioritize yourself and your needs, especially when you have all of this stuff coming at you? I call it hyper stimulation. Mm-hmm. And you have responsibilities of home, work, perhaps, you know, a partner, kids. How, how, what do you need to do inside yourself to go, okay, no, this is not useful to me? I think, 
there's a few things going on here, which is one, of course, it's so important that we work on ourselves in terms of our own value. Mm. And that in saying, you know, what do I want to be doing to myself? And then understanding what's in our space and, and how it's impacting us. If you can see yourself, like if you can see responses that you have that are like red flags, like, yes, you want to have, you know, all the information. And I totally understand that. I mean, I, I want to know what's going on as well. But when you have that influx, see how you're feeling. Are you like, resentful, frustrated, angry, snapping at people? Do you show up differently? And are you okay with that? You know, the answer is not the same for everyone. That's why it's so important to ask these questions. But if you're feeling that, then you have to look at, okay, what am I afraid of missing out? And, and what will that mean? Now, if you want to be informed, you're totally within your rights to be informed. There are options. There are ways to have a balance. For example, you can say, I have carved out a time in the morning where I'm going to check specific news feeds. That's another thing. Be very diligent. Be ruthless. Just like when you're decluttering and you're, you're saying, okay, I want to have the best quality item here and the mm -hmm. rest I can throw away, right? It's the same thing with information. Okay, what's my best news source? Let's stick with that. I don't have to have all of the sources. I can do this. Or I can do one that uh, condenses it for me. Uh, I, For a while, I was subscribed to something called Skimmed, and they would just give me the highlights and let me know what was going on. And then if mm -hmm. I wanted to learn more, I could learn more. You can pick a time of day where you're going to check on things, but then you need to shut off the notifications. As long as you're controlling the notifications, you can control your day. As long as you're alternating. Also, too, if you really want to know what's going on, but then you have a stress response, then the next thing you need to do needs to be something that will counteract it. For example, if you really need to check the news that's important to you, well, then do it. But then you do your yoga practice after. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's, you're having that balance. And, and the balance is really important. I agree. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Well, I just agree with everything you're saying. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm moving into your house tomorrow. Uh, so, <laughs> but, but at the same time, I come back to this notion of self-awareness. Mm -hmm. You have to know yourself pretty well to go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm doing too much of this. I'm looking at this too much. I'm reading this too much. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. obviously overwhelmed or I'm having this big emotional response to X, whatever X is. Yes. What if, if you have a client who comes to you and goes, I'm just bah, my hair's on fire, like I've been saying. So they're over they're overstimulated with mm -hmm. all of the stuff with all the stuff in their inbox. What's the first step? What do you say to someone when they come to you and they go, I'm, I'm imploding because there's just so much? What is the first thing you tell someone like that to do? Take a deep breath. <laughs> 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 know that it's going to be okay. Mm hmm know that there are going to be some trial and error when it comes to this. You're absolutely right. I know people want magic bullets. They want quick fixes. There are some things that are quick fixes, to be honest, going cold turkey with some of these things and, and setting up a time, you know, setting up timers and, and practicing things like, you know, uh, avoiding <laughs> certain, uh, certain things can help, but I'm not an extremist in that regard because mm -hmm. again, it goes back to so much of what we talked about today, which is we need to create habits and we need to create structure. But the biggest thing we do is to step back and say, what do you want? <laughs> what, what do you want your life to look like? Uh, you can even journal it and, and envision it. Like I would like to wake up in the morning and I would like, you know, I, I mean, I know some of it's not realistic uh, and this can happen with the comparison that we see the highlight reels that we see on social media, but in your heart, you do know what you want. You do know that you want to, you said it yourself earlier in our conversation about showing up best for your clients and your husband, you know, your, your friends and family and, and just being the best you, you can be the things that you love to do, you know, what your, uh, 
zones of genius are. You know where you are happiest, where you light up and where you shine. So that's really the first step is we identify what do you need to be doing? What do you want to be doing? And and you do have to identify both because if you are responsible for a family, you have, you need to bring in income, you know, there are certain factors, things that need to be done, but uh, you can very quickly find the alignment or find where things are out of alignment, things that you can try that you can in fact declutter. That, that's the first step is, is understanding what it is that you want. And, and I just deciding that something's not working. So let's change it up. That's all. <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> Ta-da. Well, that's it. So uh, I, I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. I'm familiar with it. Okay. So it's it's a book about creative recovery. It's where she takes creatives, people who want to be creative and sort of takes them through a 12-week process mm-hmm. to to find their creative genius again. And one of the things that she talks about is crazy makers. They are the people who as soon as you sit down to paint or to write or to whatever, they're the ones who call you and go, "Ah, my boyfriend broke up with me. I need your attention right now." Right? Mm-hmm. So so what happens when you are trying to organize your life, but you've got crazy makers in it? What is the process of dealing with someone who who resists what you're trying to do as far as organization, as far as decluttering? Now, that might be a partner. Mm-hmm. That might be a friend. What are What are your thoughts on working through that with someone, especially if you're living with them, but also friends who might might resent you for almost deciding to make those changes. Mm, I love that you asked this because now we're talking about boundaries, (laughs) 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 which is like one of my favorite. I love that you sang that boundaries. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of my favorite things. So I, you know, there's, again, there's a number of things because you have to come at it from different angles but Mm -hmm. let's start start at the very beginning uh (laughs) where we talked about before now i'm I'm just gonna sing the rest of the episode i um, i love it do it please (laughs) when you start at the beginning of saying what is it that you want and you make that decision it's amazing what happens when we decide something we decide and we understand Mm -hmm. you are going to need to dig in deep to that why. It's the reason why we talk about this. What's your purpose? What's your why? I love Simon Sinek's start with why Mm -hmm. for that very reason. But understanding that, that's what you're going to have to dig into when people start to object because they will. Okay, that is going to happen. And sometimes that's a way that you can tell you're on the right track because (laughs) you're messing with the status quo here. Mm -hmm. Maybe before, and this happens especially with codependents and things like that, uh, you know, people pleasers, if you're a recovering people pleaser, it's not always easy because everyone else around you had expectations Mm -hmm. that you would show up, that you would in fact answer the damn phone every time they called about their latest boyfriend issues. That's Mm -hmm. what you do, isn't it? And when you stop doing that, it's going to throw them. One of the things that I recommend, in addition to making sure that you are confident, because if this is something you truly want, it will help you push through instead of caving. Mm -hmm. The next thing is figuring out what are those chunks of time that you need the quiet and creating parameters. I cannot remember the exact quote I I will find it and send it to you, but it's this idea that uh, boundaries are, you know, it's when you're thinking about it's not walls, it's doors. A wall, you know, just blocks everyone out. A door shows them where they come and go. So think about creating specific doors. So it's like I'm going to be doing um, my music from three to four, you know, whatever. And uh, my phone's going to be turned off. If you Mm -hmm. call, just leave a message. I'll get back. I'll get back to you as soon as I'm done. Now it's going to take some training. It's going to take them getting used to the fact that you're not responding immediately. This is an important technique for when we uh, are working in, uh, you know, a business capacity at home as well, creating 
our own business hours. Well, you have to think of this as your own personal hours or your creative hours as well. Um, in terms of the other question you asked, like if you're trying to declutter and you're getting objections from a partner, well, it's important to understand the objections are often for the same reasons. Every time you do something um, and someone else responds, their response is not about what you're doing. It's about who they are and what they're thinking about what you're doing, how mm -hmm. they feel, what how it's making them feel. Sometimes it's reminding them that they need to get their ish together. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. making them feel like um, they can't, there's something changing in you and, and it you know, they're on uncertain footing. I mean, it can be any number of responses. So communication is key. Hopefully you would have a spouse or partner who is at least wanting you to be happy and content. And so communicating with them and saying, I want to declutter the space. I, I, because this is what I'm looking for. This is where I'm struggling. And this is what I think will help. And many times I've worked with, with clients who have a spouse or a partner who isn't interested in that. And it's like, okay, well, we're not going to touch your stuff, but we are going to communicate with you so that you understand what's happening, what's important, why this is important and how you can support. Uh, trust is a big thing, which comes from communication. A lot mm. of times people will get defensive because they think, oh, you're going to mess with my stuff too. And if you make sure they understand, no, that's not the thing. And I always, always with every one of my clients, I'm like, please do not declutter your husband's stuff. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't take your children's toys and toss them when they're at school. You are going to undermine the trust that you have. There needs to be communication and engagement in all of this. But when you're doing it first, sometimes you can model it for them. It's one step at a time, communicate and trust what you're doing. I guess that's what I would leave you with. I love that. I love, 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 love that. And I feel like now you and I can both go and scene. <laughs> That was that was brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for 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 being so generous with your wisdom. I really appreciate it. It's so there's I think there's a uh, perhaps a misunder misapprehension. I'm not sure that creative people have to be messy. That that creativity comes from a messy mind and a messy desk, mm -hmm. but not necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I personally, I think mindfulness plays a huge role in how well we're able to create, but, but the fact that you have this wonderful system and I'm super excited to share your work with all of you who are listening. Uh, I, I would love I would love to get from you if you would, where someone can find you uh, and and how can someone find Lisa and positively productive so that they can start perhaps doing some of this for themselves with you. Mm -hmm. You can start at my website very easy, positivelyproductive.com. And on there, you will find how I coach with people. You will find my uh, a link to sign up for my membership. If that's something that interests you, it's kind of a, a nice way to dip your toe in the pool of of getting <laughs> getting a, a you know coaching assistance in this regard and and kind of trying to incorporate these new habits and explore these things and, and get that guidance there's a, a I have a gratitude group that's free that's year round that's also on the site if you hang out on social media I'd love to hear from you on Facebook I'm at positively productive and on Instagram oh we have so much fun positively underscore Lisa and of course, I invite everyone to listen to the Positively Living podcast as well. I talk about these things all the time, too. Fabulous. That's so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I'll be putting the links to all of that in the show notes so that uh, if, if you missed the actual naming of the URL, you can go to the show notes mm -hmm. and grab the link and, and get to the membership group, which I, what a great idea. I, to me, membership groups are, are one of those things where 
you can come and and give advice but also get advice and it's really the combination of that of those two can be really helpful particularly if you're feeling that that hyper stimulation and overwhelm that we were talking about earlier yeah surrounding yourself with the right kind of community and being able to do it in a way where it doesn't add to your overwhelm cuz that's that's what has been a frustration of mine in the industry for so long. It's like, here, join this boot camp and we're just going to focus on decluttering. And it's like, what about the rest of your life? Right. So, yeah. And and you and it's a balance. You know, we keep yeah. talking about balance and self-awareness. Those are those are two of my favorite uh, sort of phrases, balance mm -hmm. and self-awareness. I I again, I'm so grateful to you for, for being here. I, I have one last question. Mm -hmm. And this is a question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. And it's a silly question, but I feel like we get poignant answers. And the question is this. If you had a plane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? This was really hard to, to pick one thing. But the thing that's on my heart is I'm going to go with, which is be kind. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, it, it absolutely. And, be kind to yourself, be kind Bingo. to others, be mm -hmm. kind, you know, be yeah. kind doesn't just mean to other people. Be it kind doesn't. also means to yourself in your own heart, in your own spirit. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a lot to be said for that. So beautifully, beautifully expressed. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate it. Once again, that was Lisa Zarotny on the Innovative Mindset Podcast. Go find her, go follow her. You will become positively productive. I love that so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Lisa, for being on the show. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. If you're liking the show, do me a favor, rate and review it. I'd love to hear from you if you've got comments and questions. And I'm here, as you know, twice a week. Mondays, I'm very happy to bring you interviews with leading peak performers in a variety of fields. And on Fridays, you get my thoughts on creativity and innovation. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg once again, reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.